We're in volume nine, page 788. And what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to talk about the tense he wrote. And we're not going to really give much of a conversation with uh, Keter. We're going to focus more on Chachma and Bina. And um, we'll mention Das. We'll mention the, the third sphere, which is interchangeable with Keter. And then we're going to go to the other sphere out of uh, Tifer and Netzachod Yusod. Do them, but not in depth. And then do Malchut as well. So we're really going to do a little bit of all the tense fear out with more of an emphasis on Chachma and Bina. But the, but the real thing we're going to work on is the idea of how the spheros give birth to one another. The, the parental element of the spheros, that the, that the higher spheros contain the potential for the lower spheros within them. In other words, if... if, if um, Chachma is the father. It first has to give birth to the mother, Bina, for it to then together have give birth to children. First to Selm, which is going to be Zer Anpin, the, the emotional sphere out, and then a daughter, which is going to be Shechina, which is going to be Malchut. And we're going to also show how one of the the beautiful things in the Zohar, is to show you how the letters in general, but in particular the letters of God's name, are manifesting in, in and of themselves. Each letter corresponds to a sphera or a, a parts of a parts of means a, a group of sphero. And also the other thing of how the, the Kabbalah in general, Zohar as well, We'll take a given letter and spell out the letter. So we'll be, for example, spelling out the letter Yud, Yud, Vav, and Dalid. Or, or we're going to spell out Bina, the, the base Yud, Nun, He. And we're going to use each one of the letters that spells out one of the letters, in the case of Yud or in the case of Bina, not, not so much the, the letter, but the word spelled out. And then correlate those letters into the story, so to speak, of this of the sphere. So it's interesting because I think there are languages that use um, kind of stories in the letters, like Mandarin, I think. So here it's more the the number. Sometimes it's it's more than just the number. It's it's something to do with the, the shape of the letter. With the yud and the vav, for example, it both is the number and the shape. So we'll do that in we'll do that in the Idrizuta. It's a section of the Idrizuta that I was saying before. I, I, I usually don't get to because Idrizuta is, you know, it's just such a magnificent, powerful piece. And and it's I usually get caught up in its uh, conversation about um, Atik and Arif and, and so on that I, I, I don't I don't see enough of what we're doing now. So it's on 788. And again, the background here that what you need to know is we're talking about the relationship between the higher spirit and the lower spirit. We're talking about the 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 word actually is flow, mazel or mazala, which means here both it's a double meaning. It means flow and it also means influence like we use the word mazel when we want to say um the zodiac the power of the of of, a, of the influence of a particular sign that influences a person or the world so um anyway that's the context of what the zohar has been talking about So like you'll see on the top of 788, it says, these shine for the radiance of the supernal concealed brain, which shines into Mazala. Top of 788, holy ancient one. 
all depend upon one another and are linked with each other until it is, it is known that all is one. So that's a very beautiful concept that what well, we have to understand about the Spiro as much as we want to differentiate them and we need to distinguish them to be able to describe them and understand them individually. We also are equally, especially in the Zohar, wanting to understand them in relationship with one another, in their, in their connectedness and in their unity. Like I said, giving birth. And giving birth, by the way, is usually um, one way, you know, the father and mother give birth to the child. But the truth is, at some point, the child can also become a parent themselves. Or, for that matter, they can kind of return the favor of the way a, a parent raised them and, like, look after their parent when the parent gets older. So there is kind of this, or even more than that, the, the parent only realizes who they are as a human being through the child. Just like you have uh, in the student-teacher relationship, the, the Mishnah tells us that one of the, the rabbis said, I learned a lot from my teachers. I learned even more from my chavrusas, my, my partners in study. But from my students, I learned the most. And it's not just being, you know, like uh, the rabbi was complimenting his students. He was being truthful that, that there's this, element where the student or the child ends up somehow reaching a part of the parent or the teacher that they didn't really have or it was only very deep in potential before they developed that relationship. That's not going to be so much explored in this, but that's explored in other parts of this are and very much emphasized in Hasidut, that idea of like the, 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 uh, ascendancy of the feminine shechina, which is like the daughter, which, which hierarchically it's the lowest, but then it gets a reverse position where it becomes the, 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 the Aishas Chayel becomes the Ateris Baila. The woman becomes the crown above her husband, so to speak. That, that's in, that, that has a lot of different techniques in terms of wanting to go lower to go higher, Ma manifesting in, in, in the, sh the Shekhinah, betachtonim in the lower realm in order for transformation, not just of the lower realm, but even of the higher levels as well. Okay, but let's, let's, that's the Hakdama, that's the intro, let's jump in now. Okay, there, these three lights illuminate three others. Okay, what are these three lights? So, um, it's talking about, I believe, within Keta, called fathers. And these fathers, so in other words, the father is going to be Chachma. But Chachma is already um, coming from the, the unknown, right? That's entering into Chachma. And from there, that will illuminate the sons, their the, the emotional sphere of. And all shines from one place. Remember, there's only one source. So it's all coming from the same source. When this ancient one, will of wills, is revealed, all shines and all exists in perfect joy. So it all starts with the, with the source of, of everything, which is the holy ancient one, which is really what the Idris are really talking about. So even in a sense, the lower spirit that we're going to be describing now are in relationship to the shining of Atik and Arach, the will and the will of wills. The will is Arach and the will of wills is Atik internal and external levels of, of Keter or Ratzon, divine will. Okay, why don't you read the note for um, 64, Zev? 64. 
Um, Actually, I was wrong about the three others. It's it's the three. It's lower than Chachma. It's not higher than Chachma. Okay, go on. So the, the three others called fathers, <clears throat> Chesed, Gvorah, and Tiferet, who are symbolized by the three patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This Sephirotic triad, in turn, illuminates the last one, Netzach, Chod, and Yesod, pictured as sons. The streaming light from the Holy Ancient One assuages the harsh, harshness of Zer Anpin, the short-tempered one, bringing joy to all. Okay. So, you know, usually it's interesting because like we were focused last week on the relationship between Tiferet and, and Shekhinah, the, the Holy One, blessed be He, and the indwelling of the divine, the divine presence and the, the feminine. And, and there often what we're describing is when the Shekhinah is turned away from Zer Ampin, from receiving, because it's not interested, because there's a, um, there's a galuta shechina, there's a, the shechina is an exile. The, the, the woman, so to speak, the Beit HaMikdash, who is the woman, the feminine, the embodiment of the feminine divine is not in a you know, face-to-face -face relationship with the, the masculine, Holy One, blessed be he. So then that's the source of exile. But here the focus is on, is the light of, of Keter shining? And if it is, then naturally it's gonna flow with great joy to the lower sphere of below it. Chesed, Gvorati, Farad, Netzachod, Yisod. Which here he's calling three, these fathers that illuminate the sun. In other words, father and son is relative. Like, I'm a father and I'm also a son, right? So they're both true. So compared to my father, I'm a son. Compared to my son, I'm a father. So that's why. Don't get too confused when you see something referred to as a father or a son, and then a line later, it's, it's the, the, the father becomes the son. Don't get confused by that. It's very simple. It's just like... I just described, you know, if I'm talking about my son, I'm a father, but if I'm talking about my father, I'm the son. So just remember that. Very important to remember that. In, in fact, when you're learning Hasidut, uh, Chabad Hasidut, which is kind of like a commentary on Kabbalah, although I think there's one of the Rebbe said, Hasidut isn't a commentary on Kabbalah, Kabbalah is a commentary on Hasidut. Which basically means to say they feel it's more important than Kabbalah. Kabbalah is good for under, to help you understand Hasidut. Whichever one you say, it doesn't really matter so much. What really matters is that when you're studying this, one of the uh, answers to many of the qu questions is it depends where where are where are we standing? What's our vantage point? Are we are we above or below? What what what's what What's the starting description of where the author of that work and that page is, is describing what he's describing from? Okay, so we continue. This Eden, now Eden, right, is Gan Eden. I mentioned we're going to be talking about Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. This Eden is drawn from supernal Eden, concealed of all, concealed, from this Eden is called beginning. And the ancient one, beginning and end, do not apply, nor do they exist. So he wants to make a distinction. In what we were talking about earlier, the holy ancient one, the word beginning is inappropriate because this is based on, like we described, the Rambam says the difference between God and everything else is God has no beginning. He, he uses a philosophical term. It's, a, it's not something that had a cause that caused it. It isn't an effect of a cause. It's not there because something else led it to be, become. So in a sense, the Zohar is, it's not really clear, by the way, is this level really God or is it, 
you know, like as close to God as you can get. From this description, it's godlike in that it has no beginning or end. And never began. Okay? So the words beginning or end don't apply to it. Nor do they exist. In other words, the idea of existence has some... It's not a subtle thing when you say something exists. And since it has neither beginning nor end, it is not called you. Now, this is a grammatic thing. I can only call, there's second person and third person. The note will describe it better. You versus um, he. He is third person. You is second person. Uh, something that's so ineffable, so un explainable, can hardly say it exists, has no beginning, no end. When you're referring to it grammatically, it's referred to as he, not you, as we'll see. Because it is concealed and not revealed, it is called he. From the place where beginning is found, it is called, now once we start talking about the place which is beginning, which is going to be Chachma. Chachma is already beginning. We'll talk about more what that beginning is. From that place and onward, it can be called you, second person. It's not as concealed. And it is called father, as it is written, for you are our father. Okay, the Agadita of the house of Rabbi, Sa of Rabbi Sava. This is an ancient work. Agadita is usually like the esoteric part of the Talmud or the Medrash. The principle of all is that Zer Anpin is called you. So just like we could call Chachma you, we also call Zer Anpin, which is after Chachma even, also you. Now when I say after, this all happens like simultaneously, but it's still considered after. The holy ancient one is called he. This is fine. It, now we apply you to the place where beginning is found although it is concealed. Next page, 789. From there is beginning, and it is called you. It is the father of fathers, and this father issues from the Holy Ancient One, as it is written, Wisdom comes into being out of nothingness. Therefore, it is not known. So let's talk a little bit about this. Two, two sayings. You are our father. And wisdom comes out into being out of nothingness. There are both verses, one in Isaiah and one in Eof. What, what is it biologically that distinguishes the father from the mother? And the answer is the father contributes something but the, there's no gestation, there's no pregnancy within the father. So there's there's like a halachi conversation. They actually got this as a as a um, question. Somebody asked me a question. Why would they put on a, a tombstone, for example? their um the father of the deceased and not the mother of the deceased by the way apparently there are certain sparta customs that do put the mother it's not because they're like egalitarian in other areas per se we're, we're not talking about a new custom we're talking about pretty old customs um but the person asked me a question a halachic question if we know that the father, it, we know that the, um, the that the mother is the mother, right? Because the mother gave birth in the hospital. People were there, the, the nurses, the doctors, the husband, the parents know. Fake news. What? Fake news. Fake news? <laughs> but, but who's the father? The, who they say is the father? Probably 90% of the time. What about the other 10%? Who knows, by the way, how many children that are born that the that the husband isn't the father? David Barrett, you you might know the statistics. 
Oh, I put you on mute. Seventy-three <laughs> percent. It's amazing. I just made so that means. Could you look it up for for us on Google while we're while we're giving the show? I'm I, I, to, I would have to get. I would have to go out of this. Okay, so don't don't leave us then. But but there's got to be a percentage of of fathers who are not really the biological father. They don't know it, right? But why am I bringing this up? Because. When you know the father is the father because you took a DNA test, or you look at the child I'm like, oh, it's obvious who the father is. Or because you just assume that the father is the father and 90% or 85%, whatever percent of time you're right, you're right. The father is the father. But because there's an element there where it's not the mother, there's a, there's a distance in just visceral knowing who the father is that takes time to like grow into. Like the mother, like the child sees the mother. The mother has the, the breast that the child nurses from. The, the mother gave birth to the child. The father is a concept that you have to believe in. So already in the Talmud, you see one second, yes. it says the child doesn't get who the father is, not because he's not a scientist, still not gonna be a scientist, till he, he, he tastes or she tastes bread. I have to be mature. Like when they're just eating, uh, you know, baby food, they don't really get it. My father is my father. It's just the guy in the house. And then they start saying, Abba, you're my father. They still don't understand the biology. Yes, Rabbi Yassim. So uh, according to DNAtesting.com, mo most paternity test labs reports that about one third of their paternity tests have a negative result. While the possible fathers who take a paternity test about 32% are not the biological father. That seems like a very high amount. Remember, this is of those who, who have if this. If, if they're only testing because there's a suspicion. So right. it's yeah, probably going to be skewed. Yeah, so it's probably skewed because of that, I'm going to guess. That but sounds I, too high. I saw I saw Kedushas Levy a few weeks ago that said that, that we're, as Jews, we're known as the sons of our fathers as like, it's a it's a merit. It's a, like that we trust B'nai Yisrael are are pure. That that you know we know who the father is, and that's why it's like a merit to us that we get to be called the sons of our fathers in our name. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, uh, lawyer, my lawyer. Can I ask a question? I am a little behind. I still have no clarity on Zeroptin. Who is that what is it so zeromben is is an amalgamation of spiro what they have in common is they are represented by the emotions of the person rather than the intellect um so they include chesed and gvura love and awe tiferet which is which is um compassion the comp some form of blend of the love and the and the judgment and then Netzef and Hod, which we might have a time to get into a little bit more later, as I've requested it, which is Netzef is the will to, to win, to dominate some situation, some relationship, some, some business, or whatever it is. Uh, Hod is empathy. Yusod is bonding or sexuality. And that so those six are collectively known as Zer Anpin. Zer Anpin literally means the small face, like the face of a child. Because relative, again, Zer Ampin, by the way, is one of those things. It's a parent and a child. So compared to Chachma and Bina, it's the child. But compared to the Shechina, it's like a parent. So it's, again, right in the middle. It's changing. It's description of whether it's mature or immature is relative to what we're talking about. You're saying, but it often appears to be like a name of God. Well, all of these spherotic kind of combinations are some aspects of God. All the spherot are elements of divine manifestation. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're saying that the the six uh, the six central spherot are called zeropin. Yes, and that's then, one of their names. There's another name. Uh, there's like a female side to zeropin. What's it called? Nukva or something. Nukva is fem, which just means the feminine. Like the Nekeva, like the woman, 
or Shekhinah, divine presence, which is the name for the for the tenth sphere, Malchut. Yeah. So Nukva is is really just the tenth Malchut. It is the exactly. It's the same thing. And sphere up then is the, is the six above Malchut. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Do I owe you anything today? <laughs> I owe you so much. <laughs> we have a lot of catching up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you for saying. Yeah, we're even. We're even. So, so um, I'll just uh, I'll tell you one halachic truism that's that's uh, beautiful and funny at the same time. So, a rabbi came to uh, somebody came to a rabbi, one of the brisker rabbis, and said, "The, the law is that." You, when your father and your mother are in a disagreement, you 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 give a little more honor to your father, but that makes no sense. You should give zero respect to your father, and a hundred percent respect to your mother, because your mother, you know, is your mother. Just like we got through that whole thing, because everybody knows, you know, she gave birth to you. The hospital, you know, recorded it. Your father is, you know, he claims he's your father. There, there's no DNA. There's no evidence of that. Um, so why do you have to listen to your father, especially when? He's in disagreement with your mother. You should totally just ignore him. So you know what the, the brisker Rav says back to this man who asked him the question? He has a brilliant, brilliant answer. He said, if you're going to not listen to your mother, I'm sorry, not listen to your father, because you're saying there's a chance that he's not your father, what you're really doing is you're totally disrespecting your mother. So you're respecting neither of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, young man, respect your father, and that way your mother will be respected as well. So that's a very funny and, and true, you know, answer to that question. But that, that addresses this issue that on, this, on the one hand, the, the father is essential um, to, to, the, to the child. But on the other hand, there's a little more distance between the child and the father and the child and the mother until up until a point a lot of children are just as close to their fathers as they are with their mothers or even closer with their fathers and their mothers what it, what i mean to say is that there's some distance that once you travel that distance there is no longer that distance <coughs> like i said with some level of understanding maturity and that leads us to the second point why is that? So I explained to you the biology of it, explained to you the element of, of, of lack of 100% knowledge the way you have with the mother. There's a second element to that. We have to look up the source of what, not just a biological father represents, but what Chachma represents. Chachma represents the bridge that comes from the level of Ayin or Keter, crown or nothingness that we said ultimately can't even be described as having a beginning or an end. Therefore, what where Chachma is coming into its own is from a mysterious source. And let me explain to you how, where we see this mysterious source. Um, the mysterious source can be best summed up when you are trying to understand a problem and the answer comes from a place of not knowing like it's not like information that you had in your head and 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 you you forgot it and you accessed it that's one type of knowledge wisdom is you know, putting together parts of the puzzle that are in your head, like a computer, you have to find them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that wasn't there. You never knew that information, not even when you were five years old. You had an original insight to resolve an issue, a question, um, a, a difficult tosfos in the, on the Talmudic conundrum, or, or for that matter, a, a new song or a new, a new plot for a movie. When that comes into you, 
it's there's a there's a mystery because you don't know where it's coming from. Now, if you were a scientist, you'd say, well, yeah, it's really coming from information that you already have, but you're just kind of putting it together, which is true. Uh, usually, the wisdom that a person has is a reconstruction of existing parts. But sometimes, what we call genius is new insight. It's new. It's a new way of looking at something. And it's not genius. What it is, is we don't, the reason why we call it genius, and we all are geniuses in this way, and we just have to access it. It's this place of not knowing because it's not known, because it's unknowable. And from that unknowableness, from that vast, infinite place in the universe that's, that's within us and without us, but not in us at all, because it's unknowable and unknown, we tap into it just enough to get something that we call wisdom. What we what in the comic books is the light bulb going off. That's the chachma. That's the meaning of the verse me'ayin to matzah. It comes from the no thingness. It comes from that realm of the unknown. And that's also what distinguishes it from the mother. The mother is known. You know why the mother is known? We'll talk about it soon more. Because the mother is knowledge, is, is more the, the, the knowing of the mother represents understanding. Understanding is when you take what's, what wisdom has given you and information that you've collected and you put it together in a, in a useful way that you can make sense out of it. Practical, perhaps, or if it's not per se something that's uh, applicable to, to real life situations, it's just theoretical, but at least it's, there's a clarity in there because it's, it's, um, it's organized in your head. So, for example, one of the differences between Chachma and Bina is often somebody who, who's more in the realm of the Chachma isn't good at articulating it. And so they don't have the word skills necessarily. They could have. But if they're stronger in the Chachma and weaker in the Bina, they have more originality and less communicable ability to, to bring it across. If they're stronger in the Bina, they can organize, and, and weaker in the Chachma, they may not have original, so many original thoughts or ideas, but they can bring other people's ideas into brilliant formation of organizational, they could write a code of Jewish law. So, I mean, to write a code of Jewish law, you really have to have some chachma also um, between you and me. You have to have a little bit of wisdom. But on some level, to write a code of Jewish law, it's just like, who, who is the halacha like? Now, I could, if I'm figuring out who the halacha is like on my own, I need to have wisdom for that. But if I'm following, if I'm going to call, if I have Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's telephone number and I call him every time I have a question, he answers it for me, I could write a shochanach. I, I could write it maybe better than him if I'm better with words than him. But it's not my ideas. Right? It's his ideas, it's his insight, the original. He had to come up with original insight to get to the halacha. He wasn't, Ramosha wasn't so much just like stating the obvious. Sometimes he stated the obvious, but, but, but five out of six times he was stating what wasn't obvious. He was a genius. He was a genius. So again, he didn't write a shukhanar. He wrote chuvot, he wrote lengthy responsa. Um, Anyway, so that's about Bina and Ch versus Chachma. Come and see. Let's continue. Elohim understands its way. Understands its way, really? It's, a, it's quoting from Eof. And he knows its place. It's continuing to quote. Its place, really? And of course its way. And of course, that wisdom concealed in the Holy Ancient One.
Okay, why don't you read uh, notes 65 through, did you read 65 yet? No. Um, no. Okay, 65 through 67, so. Um, 65. This Eden is drawn from supernal Eden. <clears throat> Chachma is drawn from the concealed brain of the Holy Ancient One, and from it, flow, the, from it the flow of emanation and all of existence begins. In the boundless realm of the Holy Ancient One itself, the terms of beginning and end do not pertain. This realm cannot be addressed directly in the second person as you, but only indirectly in the third person as he. The more personal pronoun you pertains to Chachma, who is also pictured as father. The verse in Isaiah identifies you as father. On Chachma as Eden, see an above note. On the concealed brain as the supernal Eden, also an above note. On Chachma as you and father, see another place in the Zohar. Um, and on he alluding to the holy ancient one or Keter, also this can be found uh, in other places in the Zohar, including Sifra Ditznius and Idra Rabba. Um, 66, in the Agadita of the house of Rav Saba. This venerable source applied to the second person pronoun you in, uh, uh, sorry, this venerable source applied the second person pronoun you to the entirety of Zer Anpin and the third person pronoun he to the holy ancient one. But Rabbi Shimon is applying you to Chachma. Although this fear is concealed, it can still be addressed directly as you. Father Chachma engenders the patriarchal triad of Chesed, Gvura, and Tiferes, who are themselves called fathers. So he is father of fathers. See the note we just read. Chachma himself issues from the holy ancient one who is called Ayan, nothingness. This paradoxical name alludes to the Holy Ancient One's undifferentiated and incomprehensible nature, no thingness. The full verse in Job reads, the Chachma Ayan Timatse, but wisdom where it is found and where, but wisdom, where is it found and where is the place of understanding? We specifically don't want to know the rest of the verse. It doesn't, it doesn't work for us, actually. Sometimes knowing context is important. Other times it ruins it. We want to read it as, Wisdom comes from the unknown, period. You know, like, okay, but it's, it's fine. Here Rabbi Shimon transforms the first rhetorical question into spiritual formula. Wisdom, in, wisdom comes into being the ayin out of nothing. That's exactly on the creative reading of the verse in Job, see several other places. The Agadita of the house of Rav Sava, the elder, is one of many volumes housed in the real or imaginary library of the authors of the Zohar. And 67, Elohim understands its way. Elohim understands its way. This verse describes how God alone knows Chachma wisdom for Rabbi Shimon. It implies that Elohim, referring here to Zer Anpin, understands its way. That is the pathways into which Chachma branches. However, only he, namely the Holy Ancient One, knows the essential place and nature of Chachma. And of course, the Holy Ancient One alone knows his own concealed brain or supernal wisdom. Um, and you can see also in Idra Rabba where a similar idea shows up. Okay. So you could see where Chachma reaches into, but you don't understand where it really came from, unless you are, of course, the Holy Ancient One, which, you know, many, met, met, maybe one of you is. Okay, let's continue. Thank you, Zev. Um, this wisdom is the beginning of all. From it expands 32 paths, paths, not ways. Of them is Torah composed of 22 letters and 10 utterances. So remember, where do we know that the 32 is 22 letters and 10 utterances? What, what book do we know that from? Sefer Yitzira. Yeah, from the Sefer Yitzira. This wisdom is father of fathers. And in this wisdom appears 
beginning and end. In other words, we can talk about beginning now. We can talk about end now, but not before that. There's higher wisdom and lower wisdom. Now that we can mention also end, there's going to be a manifestation of wisdom in a, in a lower place as well. When wisdom expands, he is called father of fathers. All is consummated only by this, as is written, all of them you made in wisdom. You want to read the notes, Ev? Uh, what is it? 68. 68. From it expand 32 paths, subtle paths, not broad and open ways. The total of 32 paths embraces the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the 10 utterances by which the world was created, which correspond to the 10 spheros. Chachma, wisdom, represents the beginning of the flow of emanation, and he includes within himself the roots of Shekhinah, who is the culmination of that flow. She is pictured as the, the daughter of father wisdom and is called lower wisdom. On the 32 paths of Chachma, see Sefer Yitzhak. Okay. It's good when we, uh, when we, when we know what's, where it's from before we have to read the note, you know? The more you do, the more you'll get that. Yeah. And it feels kind of different when you know where something comes from. So what's what how, how it's being now kind of explained in the context of, of the czar now. So it's really only when we begin, it's interesting because even though theoretically the tenth sphere begin before Chachma in Keter, but here it's like no, not until Chachma can we begin to talk about the 32. Paths, not ways. Okay, let's continue on the next page, uh, 790. Rabbi Shimon raised his hand and rejoiced. He said, surely it is time and all is demanded in this hour. Remember, it's his, his day of his passing. And he's saying that this is like the special day that is going to be the day that he can reveal the, the deepest secrets of the Kabbalah. So that's when he gets excited, it's kind of a reminder of the unique quality of the Idrizuta. Come and see. When the Holy Ancient One, concealed of all concealed, sought to array all as male and female, in the place where male and female were combined, they did not endure, rather in another existence of male and female. So that, that kind of sounds like, you know, what we would call the um some part of the creative process that didn't work out either either uh danny will suggest it's it's when god created adam and eve as one person together or as we learned in other places as earlier versions of the of the spirot that 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 you know we call the olamatohu that i made famous but already exists to some degree within the zohar as well uh, there it's about the seven kings that died in, in the Zohar that's then amplified by the Ari. Come and see. Oh, we did that already. Uh, the wisdom principle of all. The, this wisdom principle of all, when it emerged and shone from the Holy Ancient One, it shone solely as male and female. This wisdom expanded and was found to be male and female. Chachma wisdom, father. Bina, understanding mother. Chachma and Bina, evenly balanced, male and female. Because of them, all exists as male and female. Were it not for this, they would not endure. By the way, look, you know, when you're going through a college library, you'll find uh, one of the books you'll find is, um, I'm terrible memory, but a book saying, what's so great about Judaism? It's the first religion that has only a male god no female there's no goddess every other religion in that time had at least a male and a female if not a whole you know thousands of deities um well not <laughs> they should read the zohar 
Although I said the Zohar came, you know, thousands of years after the beginning of Judaism. Uh, but the truth is, is that's a very kind of like interesting, also uh, a, a very narrow reading of biblical texts. The people who just see it as the male God, they're, they're obviously, I don't want to, I don't want to get into trouble. So I'm not going to talk about uh, other ways of reading the, the biblical text, which more and more is being done to show biblical scholarship is showing that many ideas in the Zohar are not very far off from um, biblical scholarship. There's uh, one of Moshe Edel's students uh, is, is doing work on showing ways in which the, you could really read the Bible as with, with a critical eye and, and see many ideas or close to the ideas of the Zohar within the biblical canon, which is fascinating. He's not saying that everything in the Bible is actually the Zohar is interpreting uh, the Bible 100% according to contemporary critical reading, but it's it's the the, the critical readers of, of the Bible. You have to understand, you know, they're they're just as susceptible to to the time period that they live in, which is you know whether it was 19th century Germany or, or, or 20th century, uh, you know, uh, uh, somewhere in California as anyone else. They're, they're, they're... So, so it's interesting to see, I, I, it, to see how that work is going to go forward. Um, this beginning... So it had to be evenly balanced, male and female, because of them all exist as male and female. So right away, I mean, again, this is very hard for people today who don't want to fit into the paradigm of, uh, you know, the classical male and female uh, paradigm. But, okay. Not really. If everything is created male and female. I know, but it's there's hard. a lot of room there. There's a lot of room there. There is a lot of room there. Um, but it's hard for people when they see this, they're like, well, what if I don't want to be with a male and female? I don't want to be with anyone. Or, you know, like I've had people uh, that I study the czar with that start crying and say they don't fit into it. Um, which is a reminder that the czar, like any religious work, isn't a scientific work. It's a work that, that, that's trying to connect with people. And if people don't feel connected to it, we have to keep working to find a way for them to connect to it. If, if I can say something, sure. it, it, uh, I, I'm in that, uh, this is so hard group online with, with Daniel Matt. And, and these kind of questions every once in a while come up and, and they're basically pretty much shoved aside, uh, except that there, there clearly are there are, let's call it underdeveloped or undeveloped parts of, let's call it the building. Let's say the Zohar or Jewish mysticism is a building and there are a whole bunch of rooms and they're very well designed. And then there's that part over there that just didn't get finished. They didn't, they didn't add on there, okay? It doesn't mean it can't, you know, it can be like, uh, uh, the oral Torah, so to speak, the part that just at a certain point, you know, maybe 300 years from now, somebody will be referring to a text. Well, it's a very old text. Well, it's, it was written about 300 years ago. So if, if that, just, you uh, get to work. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it's an interesting idea because like we, what you said about this, you know, sometimes people read this text and look at it and say, okay, it's binary. But what's really interesting about it is, but God includes both, which yeah. means that God is, well, one could use words that would trigger people, but it's interesting to imagine that. So there's a place for it within yeah. it. Yeah, that, that's the first, you know, when I first would explain that, I thought it was, you know, it would get through to people, contemporary people, because of that. It's not the male, you know, patriarchy that that they envision it to be. But even this is still disappointing to some people. 
because it's still not speaking to where they are exactly. And they're like, you know, what? there's so many pronouns or whatever it is right now. It's it's so complex, the, the, the gender issue. And, and if anything, I think Zeb was alluding to it, the, the, the Zohar is on some level progressive about some of these things, but can it keep up with everyone? You know, like you said, not the built out part of the building. You have to find out, yeah, you have to keep uh, looking around, but, but there's a lot to look into. There's a lot, there's a lot. Um, and part of the problem is, is that as soon as you say something that doesn't speak to someone, they right away assume that the Zohar is like, it's not for them. And the truth is, it's like, there's so, the Zohar is such a big, beautiful labyrinth of, of, of so many experiences and, and so much in it that you really just need to keep studying to find your, your uh, uh, part of it that resonates with you. I don't think the Zohar is the type of work that every line of it is, look, I love the Talmud, I love the Zohar. I'm not gonna lie to you and say every line of Talmud is fascinating to me. I mean, it isn't. Some of the lines are very boring and very, and very. Um, I don't wanna say distressful as much as just like, I don't find them relevant and interesting. They only become relevant and interesting because there are some other parts that fascinate me. And then they're all interlinked somehow once you really dive deep enough into it. So the, the boring parts become interesting all of a sudden because you know some other part of it that then informs what you thought was boring. Let's argue the same thing with Zohar. You know, like what you think is kind of not interesting. It may not be from just reading that one text in and of itself, but then when you keep studying, you fill out that home, you see the view, you know, and it's stunning. This beginning is father of all, father of all fathers. They join to one another, Chachma, father, Bina, mother. And it is written, Ki aim lebina tikra. Indeed, you will call Bina, mother. It's Proverbs. When they joined, they generated offsprings and faith spread. Mm. Go ahead and read the notes of 69. Um. <clears throat> Is that where, are we not a little farther than that? No. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I see. 69, surely it is time to reveal the secrets of Kaufman being a father and mother before Rabbi Shimon passes away. Uh, 70, to array all as male and female. Within the Holy Ancient One appeared the androgynous archetype composed of male and female, but these could not endure or be expressed distinctly until they emerged as Kaufman and Bina. Um, and then 71, this wisdom uh, principle of all. The pr primordial realm of Chachma wisdom generates all. When Father Chachma issued from the Holy Ancient One, he included Bina within himself. She then emerged as a separate sphere. Together, Chachma and Bina sustain all gendered existence. It's fascinating. Then, yeah. And one more, right? Yeah. 72, father of all fathers, initially of the patriarchal tribe, Chesed, Vor, and Tiferes, who are described as fathers. When Chachman and Bina united, they generated the lower spirit, and the flow of emanation described as faith spread. The verse in Proverbs reads, Ki'im Bina Tikra. And indeed, if you call her, or call, or call out to understanding and raise your voice to discernment. Midrashic interpretation playfully changes the vowel beneath the aleph of im, if, thereby turning it to aim, mother, and transforming the sense of the first half of the verse, uh, ki aim libina tikra, indeed, if you will call bina mother. Here, Rabbi Shimon adopts the Midrashic reading to demonstrate that bina is the divine mother. Okay, great. Continue on to the next page, 791. In the Agadita of the house of Rabbi Yeva Saba, it was taught as follows. What is Bina? Well, one joined the other, the Yud with He. She became pregnant and produced a son. They generated all... Now, if you just look at the Yud, what a Yud, versus letter He, 
the yud looks more like a, a you know, a, a masculine symbol, and the hey looks like a home or like a womb. So the yud basically impregnates the hay, and they produce a son. The son is the the spirit of chesed, gevura, tiferet. Maybe all of Zer Anpin, right? All of those Spirot from Chesed to Yisod. And they generated offspring. Thus, Bina, understanding, has the following letters in it. Bina has the base of the Nun. If we reconfigure the letters slightly, which means Ben, son, and Yud and He, which are those two letters of. God's name, which is the first yud is the Chachma, and then the second, the He is the Bina. Son of yud He. In other words, you know what Bina is? It is the son of yud He. It's, it's both, even though it's, it sounds weird to say it's the son of yud He. it's like saying your wife is your daughter. It's kind of weird, but, it's, but we're talking about divine unfolding, so it doesn't, don't, don't take it too literally. Um, and also it's the together with Yud coming together with hey, they have a son. So you could read it like you could read it both ways. Perfection appears, the two of them uniting, and the son within them. Summation of all. So, in other words, when Yud and the Hey combine, then they have a son who's already there in them potentially. And just they manifest it externally as well. Summation of all. In their array appears complete perfection, father and mother, son and daughter. Who's the daughter? The daughter is going to be the Shekhinah. These matters have been conveyed only to the holy ones of the Most High who have entered and emerged. That's a, that's a term from the Gemara and Chagiga about the four that entered into Pardes and only Rabbi Akiva entered. Nichnas B'Shalom, B'Yatza B'Shalom. He not only entered in peace and complete and whole and healthy, he also came out in peace. So this is saying you really want to understand this. You have to be from the Yardim Merkava for those who can enter into Pardes and successfully travel there uh, in peace and come out in peace. who knows the way of the Blessed Holy One, who do not deviate from them to the right or the left, as it is written, for the ways of God are right. The righteous walk in them, while transgressors stumble in them, Hosea. Happy is the share of, who, of one who is worthy of knowing his ways and not erring in them. For these matters are concealed in the Holy One. The Holy Ones of the Most High are illumined by them as one is illumined by the radiance of a lamp. So basically, it's in praise of this group of people who, in the merit of Rabbi Shimon Vayachai, are basically on the level of Rabbi Akiva. They've obtained that level. These matters have not been transmitted to anyone who has not entered and emerged, for whoever has not entered and emerged, better for him if he has not been created. For it has been revealed before the Holy Ancient One concealed the book concealed, that these words shine in my heart in the fullness of love and awe of the Blessed Holy One. Again, this is part of the, the greatness of, of uh, the Idrisuta, of this kind of Rabbi Shimon waxing eloquent, not only about his um, experience of understanding these insights, but what it's like to experience them, how great it is to, to be him, or to be in his presence on this day. And again, I, I, I've been arguing that what's been going on on the day of Lagba Omer is, is people wanting to really talk about this, but not knowing how to do it other than by singing and dancing. You know, meaning it, it, it's, it's like we 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 we've become focused on the externality of the of, of the beauty of the idra idra zuta because we can actually go to the place 
that's represented by this light. But in truth, the light is in the book itself as much as it is in that place. And I don't want to say probably if you go there and you have the book and you know the book, it's a better combination than either not going at all or going and not knowing. But, you know, more work needs to be done to, to, to get into this space that's being described here than just going to making a physical appearance. That's my I've been saying that the last few years, I'm not putting down the Rome, God forbid. I'm just, I've just really been thinking over the last few years that I'm not blaming it on Miron or blaming it on, on any of the popular bonfires and events. I just, the more I learned the Idrizuta, the more I feel like we're kind of like, it's called an, an expression, when, when you see something happening, but they're missing the point. So I just kind of feel I'm not, I'm not, no, I have nothing against any of the celebrations. They're all wonderful that happen, except obviously the tragic thing, ones that are terrible. Um, but I do feel that we need to be re, re examining kind of what the the Iker is here, what, what the primary thing here is. Okay. Um, for it is revealed before the holy ancient one concealed of all concealed. For these words shine in my heart and in the fullness of love and all the blessed Holy One. And as for those sons of mine here, I know that they have entered and emerged from these matters. They're not all of them. Now they have been illumined completely as should be happy as my, my, my share with them in that world. Okay. Go ahead, read the notes, Ev. Okay, and uh, this this might be the last note I can read before I have to go over tomorrow. Sure. sure. Um, so seventy three is in the I got it of uh, the house of Rav Yeva Sava. This venerable source contains a mystical interpretation of the name of Bino, reading it as Ben Yud He, son of Yud He. The point like letter yud symbolizes the primordial point chachma the feminine marker hey symbolizes bina the divine mother together they engender zer anpin the son and shrina the daughter you got it to have the house of that we just read about that and then 74 the proven spiritual seekers who have engendered the orchard of wisdom and emerged in peace uh, Rabbi Shimon refers to his companions as the sons of mine here. This phrase, though not all of them, qualifies these matters, not the sons of mine. The companions had not fully explored or understood the secrets, in particular those relating to Father Chachma and Mother Bina, which Rabbi Shimon had not revealed in the earlier gathering, Idra Rabbah. Now the companions have been illumined completely. Um, and Rabbi Shimon looks forward to sharing with them the bliss of the world that is coming. The phrase entered and emerged derives from the famous story of four rabbis who entered the orchard, that is, who engaged in mystical contemplation. Only Rabbi Akiva entered in peace and emerged in peace. In the Zohar, entering and emerging refers to the seeker who has entered the realm of mystery and emerged unscathed, one who has plumbed the secrets and discovered how to apply them in his life. Normally, entering and emerging is a highly advanced stage, but here Rabbi Shimon insists that without this, life is pointless. Better for him <clears throat> uh, if he had never been created. Uh, can see in Idra Rabba where he says, for whoever has entered and not emerged, better for him if he had not been created. The companions participating in Rabbi Shimon's final gathering had already proven themselves in the, early gather in the earlier gathering, which is the Idra Rabba. And then there's a number of sources on entering and emerging um, on the expression better for him had he never been created. Um, see what it says in Chagiga, where it says whoever contemplates four things better for him if he had never come into the world. What is above, what is below, what is before and what is after. Whoever shows no concern for the honor of his maker better for him if he had never come into the world. The expression holy ones of the most high appears in Daniel where it refers to the people of Israel. On the concluding sentence. See Rabbi Shimon's similar remark to Rabbi Yitzchak in Intra Rabba, where he says, happy is your share, happy is my share, along with you in the world that is coming. 
Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to the top of the page. Rabbi Shimon said, all that I have said about the Holy Ancient One and all about Zer Ampin is all one. That's how we started this off, by saying all the ten spirits are really one. It is all, all one entity with no separation pertaining. Blessed is he, blessed be his name forever and ever. Come and see, the beginning called Father is included in Yud, which depends upon the Holy Mazala. I remember the Yud has a, a, the Yud is a point, but within the point, there's a tippy, tippy point of it, which refers to its relationship with Arich and Atik, with the Keter, that's the, that's the crown of the Yud, as it, as it sips, and I use the word sip because the word ma, Mazla is a reference to a, uh, a sipping, but not so much through the mouth, but almost like, like a dew, right? Because that's the way we describe something that emanates without it being a rain, but it's it, it's like rain, but it's a it's a it's a finer, it's a mist. So it is the most concealed of all letters, because the yud is the smallest letter. So if we had to write a letter, but also make it almost hidden. It would be the father, it would be Chachma. Yud includes other letters, Yud beginning and end of all. So everything begins with Chachma. All of creation begins with Chachma. Now, what about Keter? Well, it's so so hidden within Keter that we don't we don't refer to it as beginning. It, it, it the source of it is Chachma, but it's such a I'm sorry, the source of it is Keter, but the relationship is distant. It's too, it's too unexplainable to even call it the source in a direct way that you could refer to it, as we said, as you. That, that doesn't start in Keter. Keter is him. It's, it's third person. It's, there's no beginning, no end. No description really there. Okay, so we continue. I guess, um, and that river now remember that Yud, we, we said that we're going to spell out the words. We're going to spell out the letters of that letter. So if you take the letter Yud and you spell it out, it would be Yud Vav Dalit. Right, so Yud is the, is, is the Chachma, which contains its relationship with Keter. The Vav is the Zer Ampin. It's the six sphere of Chesed that you saw that we were talking about before. And the Dalid will probably be either the four, um, the, sp the, the dimensions of four, which could either be the, the, the four heads of the rivers that emanated from the, in relationship to the, 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 the Nahar Hayotze Me'edin. Okay, let's see what it says. And that river flowing forth, that's the Nahar, that's from Genesis, the, the river that flows out of Eden, is called the world that is coming. Coming constantly and ever ceasing. Because, you know, we think of the world that is coming, it's not here yet, but actually what it, what it really means is it's always coming. It's not, it never ends. This is the delight of the righteous attaining this world that is coming constantly to the garden, ceaselessly. So either it's coming from Chachma, which its source, you know, the Chachma is getting its source from even above that. So it's getting this like amazing heavenly insights that are flowing into it and then trickling into Bina and then flowing down the river of, of, the, of, the, of Zer Ampin. And then finally reaching into the Shechina, the Machut, the, 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 the Gan, the Garden of Eden. The Gemara says, Gan Lechud Be'edin Lechud. They're, they're both, there's the garden and there's the river. Okay? The two things. We always say Gan Eden, but it's actually, there's, there's, there's Eden, and then that, from Eden, Nahar Yotzim Eden, Lahashkot, that's Saigon. The river flows out of Eden, which is Bina, and, and, and it Flows, which is Zeir Amba, the flow itself, Chesed to Yisod, 
into Gan, into Shekhinah. The light of the righteous attaining this world that is coming constantly to the garden ceaselessly, as is written, like a spring whose waters do not fail in Isaiah. That world that is coming is created by Yud, as it is written, a river issues from Eden to water the garden, Genesis 2, 10. Yud including, includes two letters. In the Agatha of the House of Rab, we have learned why are Vav Dalit included in the Yud? Remember, we spell out the Yud as the Vav Dalit. Well, the planting of the garden is called the Vav Dalit. Why? The garden is called the Vav, and there's another garden which is Dalit, Dalit, which is four. As it's watered by this Vav. This corresponds to the mystery that is written the river issues from Eden, who is Eden's supernal wisdom, which is Yud to water the garden, Vav. And from there it divides and becomes the river, heads, Dalad, all included in Yud, Vav, Dalad. Okay, so that's really how each one gives birth to the other one and contains the other one's potential. And therefore they're all in them, each other. They're all, they're all found in, by the time you really, to get to the first discussion of anything at all of, of this Keter Elyon, this, this supernal crown, everything is already there, it just needs to manifest. Keter already has, contains the, the potential for Chachma, Chachma contains the potential for Bina, Bina contains the potential for the Zer Ampin and Tiferet. And that's the beauty of the tense Firot is they are all God because they're all really one. They're not really separate. And yet we do describe their alienation, but ultimately that alienation is a temporary state that we're trying to overcome and get back to their, their it, revealing their real unity, which is, which is the, the, the point of this.